we're, we're pretty much ready. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so hello everyone, can everyone hear me okay? At the yes. Best? Yeah, perfect. Um, so hello and welcome and thank you so much for coming along to our Creating Habitat for Pollinators workshop. Uh, my name's Naomi and I work in the Sustainable Monash team, helping out with the Guards for Wildlife program and as well with waste education. Um, we're also joined by a few other Monash staff just helping out with the car park delivers at the moment, but um, they'll be coming in and we do have Trish, our sustainability coordinator, here tonight as well. Before we get started this evening, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the Monash lands, so the Wurundjeri, Waiwurrung and Bunurong people. I recognise their continuing connection to the land and waterways and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the First Nations people and communities that preserved the land, flora and fauna uh, for thousands upon thousands of years. And I think it's really important and great to see so many of you tuning in online and signing up to these events um, so we can all learn how to, we can each contribute to protecting our environment and conserving it uh, now and into the future. Um, so whether you have a backyard, courtyard, or even just plant pots uh, on a balcony, there's so many actions you can do uh, to help uh, increase uh, biodiversity and to help our environment out, as well as to green up and beautify the areas that we live. Um, so. A big part of that as well is creating habitat for wildlife and going into the years to come that'll be a really really important part of uh, ensuring that we're maintaining our really important creatures and pollinators as we'll learn more about with Helen. Um, so just a quick few housekeeping matters, our bathrooms are on this level just crossing the building directly, our major exits uh, for the people in person are just down at the Glen Waverley Library entrance and the water feature entrance. Uh, we do have tea, coffee and water at the back, so feel free to serve, your, uh, serve yourself throughout the workshop. Uh, Helen will speak more on this, but we will have time for questions throughout the session. They will be set times, um, but if we do run out of time or miss your question or if you're on the online live stream, we will be sending a follow-up uh, answering all questions that we maybe didn't get to. So, uh, And that will also have a recording of the live stream so you can access it uh, later on. Uh, so without further ado, I'd just like to introduce the amazing Helen uh, from Friends with Honey. So joined by Ben, who's running the live stream session. Helen is a certified permaculture designer, member of the Victorian Apiarist Association and a passionate beekeeper. So Helen's done some fantastic work over the years, founding the social enterprise Friends with Honey and empowering people to make a positive impact on the environment through education and programs. So Helen's created a citizen science tool for Parks Victoria and is continuously showcasing her passion, sustainability, biodiversity and the power of pollinators. So please join me in welcoming Helen. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation who are the original um, custodians and traditional owners of the land I'm presenting from today. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and I extend this respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. This event's being live streamed on YouTube and we've got about 60 participants um, joining us digitally. So hi to everybody who is tuning in from home. Feel free to drop us a comment as we go along. Um, and as part of the fact that this is live streamed, um, you'll be able to review the presentation um, afterwards if needed, and you can also share it with your friends and family. Um, so again, welcome. Uh, my name's Helen. I'm honoured to be your presenter tonight. Um, as a passionate beekeeper and member of the Victorian Apris Association, I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to share my knowledge and experience with you. Tonight, I hope that you'll gain some valuable insights about the importance of pollinators and learn some ways that you can help them by creating all important habitat for our pollinating species in your own backyards. I really hope that this presentation sparks your interest and that you'll be inspired to learn some more because there's a lot of resources out there and I'm going to share a selection of them with you throughout this presentation tonight. I've also got three very simple calls to action that I'm going to mention and if you can apply any of these you should be really proud because all the changes that we can make at home have a huge impact on our global well-being and of course the well-being of our pollinators. 
So a little bit about myself. As I mentioned before, I'm a passionate beekeeper. And these pictures here are from my farm in um, regional Victoria where the bees have been busy pollinating the fruit trees. My farm's on 45 acres of rural conservation land and it's absolutely full of native grasses and biodiversity. Um, I also keep bees in Melbourne where I have a tiny suburban unit and in that space I also keep chickens and grow as much as I can on about 110 square metres. So first and foremost tonight I really want to emphasise that pollinators are everywhere um, and whether you have a tiny urban unit, even a flower pot, um, or a bigger block, um, there's things that you can do to help pollinators. Um, I'm passionate about pollinators and I run my own social enterprise business called Friends with Honey. Um, it's all about um, environmental education on the themes of biodiversity, sustainability, pollination and citizen science. I'm a really big believer that when we understand the connections in nature, we want to act for nature and do good things for the planet. Um, so if you'd like to connect with me, I've made things very simple. All you need to do is scan the barcode and it'll take you to my Linktree page where you can follow me on Facebook, etc. So I run activities and workshops for both adults and kids, teaching three-year-olds about the importance of bees, right through to having written the Citizen Science Toolkit for Parks Victoria. So tonight we're all here to be talking about the fascinating world of pollinators and the critical role that they play in our ecosystems. And in particular, I'm gonna be talking about how we can support our pollinators by creating habitat for them. Now we've got quite a lot to cover tonight and some important pollinator species to talk about. So to kick things off, I'm gonna start with the big picture of ecosystems. Um, and we'll then zoom in and take a closer look at some of our most important pollinator species. And for each of these species, we'll delve into their natural habitats and how they interact with their environment. And then we'll also explore the significance of artificial or supplementary habitat features, understanding how we can create havens for pollinators in our own backyards and communities. And then lastly, we're gonna be discussing some of the overarching principles of how we can protect and advocate for pollinators. And I've created, as I mentioned before, some very simple actions that are the overarching lessons for tonight. So I'm gonna fast forward and mention these three actions before we even get started, because if there's anything that you should take home from this presentation, it's these three simple calls to action. So first and foremost, your, you wonderful people are all here tonight with an interest in learning more. We need to raise greater awareness and foster a greater understanding of the importance of our pollinators um, in our food systems and also in our ecosystem health. And this includes educating our kids, the general public, policy makers and even farmers about the interdependence between pollinators, our food security and ecosystem health. Now an incredible figure is that one in every three bites of food that we eat depend on pollinators um, and some of the most important foods that underpin a healthy human diet are made available to us as a result of pollination. So the second action is um, reducing and eliminating the use of harmful insecticides, pesticides and herbicides. These chemicals impact not only um, the bad bugs, but also the good ones too. Um, so this could be from critters in the soil to insects in your garden. So we need to adopt more sustainable gardening and agricultural practices that promote pollinator conservation. And then lastly, we need more habitat. And there's a diverse range of plants suitable for all sizes and climates that can attract and provide nourishment and habitat for pollinators. So basically we need to plant for the pollinators. So let's begin by zooming out and looking at the big picture. Australia is one of a group of 17 mega diverse countries. Now you might ask, what makes these countries so special? Well, despite covering less than 10% of the world's total um, air, land area, mega diverse countries are home to over 70% of the Earth's biodiversity. So Australia is recognised as a global spot for hotspot for biodiversity. We have 89 distinct bioregions. So a bioregion is defined by its unique combination of geology, climate and ecological communities. So for example, um, coral reefs, rainforests, deserts and grasslands. 
So due to how the earth has evolved over thousands of years, the biodiversity in Australia is often quite unique when compared to other countries. So um, Australia's isolation as an island continent has resulted in the evolution of many unique species that are found nowhere else in the world. Of course, we all know kangaroos, pictured here, um, koalas, wallabies and platypus, and there's many more. However, our country's biodiversity is also characterised by a high number of endemic species that are threatened with extinction. And some examples of these are the Leadbeater's possum, the swift parrot, the corroboree frog, and more. Um, so when we talk about an endemic species, it's a species that's um, native to and found exclusively in a particular geographic region or area. So endemic species are particularly important for conservation efforts because they're often highly specialised and they've evolved to live in specific habitats or ecosystems. Um, so across the globe, approximately 1.3 million species of animals have been named and described and each one plays a unique role in their own ecosystems. So here in Australia, we have around about an estimated 200,000 um, named and described species with around 100,000 of these being invertebrates. And of course, the majority of pollinator species are invertebrates. Um, and Australia boasts a really rich diversity of pollinators. So as you can see here, um, some of those incredible figures there, 420 um, species of butterfly, 20,000 species of moth, um, and moving on. And I'm gonna be talking about some of these species throughout the presentation. So despite all of these remarkable species discoveries, there's still so much left to uncover. Approximately 70% of species still remain unknown. So you can imagine the countless pollinators that are yet to be discovered, each with their own unique adaptations um, and contributions to the planet's health. So one thing that you'll realise from um, tonight's presentation is that there's an awe-inspiring biodiversity of pollinators and they all play a vital role in the health of our planet. So habitat plays a really critical role in supporting the survival and well-being of our pollinators. So I want to sort of talk a little bit about habitat so that we can truly understand what it is. So habitat's not just a physical location, it's a place that animals call home. And it provides all the essential resources needed for their survival and in many cases it allows them to thrive. So just like us, animals need food, water, shelter, oxygen to grow and reproduce and ensure the continuity of their species. So pollinators like bees, butterflies, birds and bats rely heavily on suitable habitat to fulfil their basic needs. So these habitats need to provide an abundant and diverse supply of pollen and nectar-rich flowers because these are the primary food sources for pollinators. So without adequate food resources, pollinators would struggle to find the energy required for their daily activities and also reproduction. Um, shelter also plays a critical role in the life cycle of a pollinator. So habitats need to provide suitable nesting sites, roosting areas and protection from harsh weather conditions, predators and disturbances. So things like trees, shrubs, grasses and even human made structures like bee hotels and bat boxes can serve as shelters for different pollinators. So creating and preserving pollinator habitats is of utmost importance and by doing so, we're really supporting the survival of our pollinator species and also safeguarding um, the essential process of our food security and ecosystem health. Um, so Australia is an extraordinary island continent. We're surrounded by over 35 kilometres of coastlines, but it's not just the coastlines that um, make the la our land unique. It's the rich diversity of landscapes. Now, I mentioned before that there's 89 distinct bioregions, and each bioregion boasts its own character shaped by factors like climate, soil, um, flora, fauna and ecological communities. So an example of a bioregion is the Great Victorian um, Desert. It's one of the largest regions in the country spanning across the states of Western Australia and South Australia. It's a vast sandy desert characterised by dunes, salt lakes, scrubland vegetation. And this arid region is home to unique flora and fauna that's adapted to survive in these harsh and dry con desert conditions. 
And speaking of arid deserts, um, it's really fascinating to note that more than two thirds of Australia falls under this category, making it the driest continent on earth after Antarctica. So now let's zoom in a little and focus on some of the terms that are important to understand in relation to the plant communities that form habitat for pollinators. So whilst we often use general terms like native plants when we're talking um, about Australian flora, it's essential to recognise that not all native plants are indigenous to a specific area where we want to plant them. So when you're browsing um, the native plant section at your local nursery, it's really important to ask whether the plant is locally native um, and assess how likely it is to survive if it's introduced to a different region. So the good news is that there's a really great list of plant nurseries in the Garden for Wildlife um, booklet on page 48, and all of these specialise in local native plants. So endemic plants are plants that can only be found in a particular geographic region because they're often more pickier with altitudes, climate, weather and soil. Um, however, um, climate change is having a huge impact on where plants and animals can grow and thrive. So we do see species making poleward migration. So poleward migration refers to the movement of plant and animal species towards the Earth's poles in response to changing climate conditions. So as the, planet, um, the planet's climate warms due to things like greenhouse gas emissions and global warming, many species are forced to adapt to the changing environment. And one way that they do this is by shifting their ranges towards higher latitudes, moving closer to the Earth's poles. So since colonisation in Australia, numerous plant and animal species have been introduced and many of them have thrived. Um, and some of them have become invasive, as you probably know. Um, so similarly, if native species are introduced to areas where they thrive excessively, they can also become invasive. So understanding local native species and their suitability to a particular environment is really critical to preserving the delicate ecological balance in your local area. Now, exploring your local reserves is an excellent way to gain a deeper understanding of the unique plant communities that thrive in their natural environments. And the Gardens for Wildlife book highlights several really great reserves that are around us um, that offer some really valuable insights into the local flora and fauna. Um, and you'll find this on pages six and seven of the guide. So the beauty of planting locally native species is their remarkable adaptability. So when they're correctly planted in suitable conditions, they have an incredible resilience and they demand minimal maintenance, which we all love. Um, so this not only makes them an eco-friendly choice, um, but also ensures that the surrounding ecosystem remains in balance. Um, move on. So an amazing and free resource is the Atlas of Living Australia. Has anybody heard of the Atlas of Living Australia before? No? I definitely encourage you to look it up. It's an online biodiversity database and mapping platform that provides access to a vast collection of information on Australia's fauna, flora and fauna. So you can see on this slide I've done a search of the Monash um, City Council area and there's just under half a million records and two and a half thousand different species recorded. So there's a lot of biodiversity all around us. Um, iNaturalist is another popular and free um, social network citizen science platform for nature enthusiasts and biodiversity researchers. And it allows users to document and share observations of um, plants, animals, fungi, and other organisms that they encounter in the wild. So the platform really encourages people of all ages and backgrounds to engage with nature and learn about the different species in their area and also to contribute to scientific knowledge. So I've done a search here on Monash City for the top 10 recorded species. And as you can see on this slide here, you know, some of them are the usual suspects like the Australian magpie. But as you delve deeper, you'll see species that you may not have even know existed in the local area. And it's local citizen scientists who are making these observations. 
Um, so when they've been through the identification process, they then become research quality and feed into the atlas of living Australia for scientists and land managers to use. So when I did this search, um, there were just over 23,000 observations and just under 2,500 species recorded. So, so much biodiversity all around us. Now, a really great place to start is to understand your own backyard food web, because um, this will really help you appreciate the food hierarchy in your garden and local ecosystems. So this triangle here illustrates how the soil is the foundation for biodiversity, because it feeds the plants that are the source of food and shelter for living things. So on this slide, I've incorporated um, the animals on my farm, but you can just as easily do this for an urban environment. And you can also include some introduced species like cats and dogs and see where they fit in to the picture. So um, bees and butterflies, which are herbivores, rely on the plants below them for food, um, pollen, nectar and shelter. And then they're also an essential food source for the carnivorous species who are higher up on the, on the triangle. So by creating deep, complex and diverse ecosystems in our backyards, we're really ensuring that our garden is functioning well and um, is healthy. So it's a sort of about replicating nature and letting go of some of our traditional ideas about what makes a garden beautiful. So we also need to appreciate that our garden is just one part of a much bigger picture and that wildlife doesn't adhere to fences or hedges. So we're part of the ecosystem. So it's a really great idea to work with that. Um, so, you know, as you do that, you'll see that you start to activate the biological aspect of your garden um, by creating, you know, an environment that supports a diverse range of insects and wildlife. We can really help to control pests naturally without the need for harmful pesticides. Um, so I'm going to give you a very real example here of the food web in action. Um, praying mantis are carnivorous insects and uh, my farm has a big apiary and lots of bees. So praying mantis are definitely in green pastures on my farm. Um, so on this occasion, the praying mantis was actually um, opportunistically preying on the little satin forester moth that you can see there. Now it ended up missing out on the um, little moth but I've no doubt that it ended up eating quite a lot of my bees for its lunch. Um, but that's all okay because um, Mr. Praying Mantis here also has lots of predators like birds, bats, reptiles, blue tongue lizards. Um, so this really keeps the ecological balance in check. And so it's all about understanding that food web. So this is the first part of the presentation. I'm wondering if anybody's got any questions so far. Yes. Years ago, there used to be sort of grassroots articles and things. There was a study there where you could actually buy things like ladybird beetle um, larva, and I wonder whether you get the same thing in praying mantis. That is such a good question. I am not a hundred percent sure, but I have seen a few forums online about that, so I can do a little bit more research and get back to you on that question. But right. I must say, I'm a big fan of praying mantis. <laughs> Right, so we're going to move on now, now that we've had a bit of a look at biodiversity and ecosystems. The next part of our presentation is a look at some of our most important pollinating species um, and how they contribute to pollination, what habitat they need to survive and how we can help them by creating um, natural and supplementary habitat. But before we go into this, I want to turn back the clock um, Pollinating species have been present on Earth for a remarkably long time, dating back millions of years. Um, the fossils of um, the remains of insects with specialised mouth parts and body structures, indicative pollina of pollination, have been found dating back to the mid-crustaceous period. So that's approximately 66 to 100 million years ago. Um, so to give you a point of reference, that's when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. So as flowering plants evolved millions of years ago, they developed a symbiotic relationship with the insects that helped them to reproduce. So their ancient presence on earth highlights their deep-rooted importance in the ecological fabric of our planet. And I want to tell you a little story. Um, I mentioned before that I go and teach kids about pollination. And one of the programs I run is a kinder program for three to five-year-olds. 
And when I go out to kinders, I teach kids about how bees pollinate flowers. And on this one occasion, there was a little boy and he was loving the activity of his bee pollinating the flower. He had a cute T-shirt with a dinosaur on it. And I said to him, do you know that um, bees have been around as long as dinosaurs? And um, he, he looked at me and there was another little girl behind him and she said, yeah, but the dinosaurs are extinct and the bees are not. And I said, that's right. That's why we need to look after our pollinators like the bees. Um, so it's a real pleasure, you know, teaching this young generation um, about the importance of pollination. Um, but no talk about habitat for pollinators would be complete without a quick lesson in the anatomies, anatomy of flowers. So by taking a close look at flowers, we can really understand the process of pollination and the symbiotic relationship between plants and pollinators. So pollen is a fine powder-like substance which is produced by the male reproductive organs or anthers of flowering plants and it serves a vital um, role in plant reproduction because it contains the male gametes um, necessary for fertilisation. So unlike animals, plants can't move around to find a mate. So pollens disperse from the anthers to the female reproductive organs of flowers through various means or vectors of pollination, including wind, water, or by animal pollinators like bees, birds, butterflies, bats, and more. So pollination occurs when pollen grains come into contact with a compatible stigma, um, allowing the male gametes to reach the ovary of the flower and fertilise the um, egg cells, leading to seed and fruit production. Nectar is a sweet sugary liquid which is produced by flowering plants and it's typically found in specialised uh, structures called nectaries which are located within the flower. So nectar serves as a reward to attract and entice pollinators to visit flowers. The composition of nectar can vary between plant species but it generally contains a mixture of sugars, primarily sucrose, glucose and fructose. And these sugars provide an energy source for the visiting pollinators. So nectar can also contain small amounts of amino acids, proteins, vitamins, minerals um, and aromatic compounds, which vary depending on the plant species. But for honeybees, this is what gives different honeys their distinctive flavours. So you may have heard of monoflora honey and polyflora honey. So monoflora honey comes from specific species. So for example, yellow box honey comes from Eucalyptus miliodora. Whereas polyflora honey comes from a variety of um, species and each polyflora honey um, has its own unique flavour. So my backyard honey in Melbourne is a polyflora honey because the bees have just been foraging on whatever's in the neighbourhood. And I've actually brought a selection over here of Victorian monoflora honeys as well as some of my Melbourne honey. So after this presentation, um, please come down and have a little taste test because then you'll really be able to see what I'm talking about. Um, so, as I mentioned before, there's a range of agents or vectors of pollination that provide the important ecological service of pollinating our flowers. So here are the main animals or who are vectors of pollination and as you can see they're not all fuzzy buzzy insects. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run through each one of these and give you a little bit more information about how they contribute to pollination and their habitat. Um, so we're going to start with one of my favourites, bats. So Australian bats play a significant role in pollination, particularly in native ecosystems um, for certain plant species that they've co-evolved with. So as bats feed, they unintentionally pick up pollen on their faces and hairy bodies and they transfer it from flower to flower, facilitating cross-pollination. They're nocturnal flies and they can travel huge distances. Um, their reputation as insatiable fruit munchers is well founded. Um, it's estimated that they can actually consume over twice their normal body mass in fruit in one night. Um, but this is great because the seeds from the fruit that they eat often pass through their digestive system intact. And because of this, they're responsible for seed dispersal, which is another really important ecological process and plays a really significant role in maintaining biodiversity and healthy ecosystems. So whilst bats are not used for pollinating commercial crops in Australia, overseas in Mexico, they're a significant pollinator of the agave plant, 
which is used to produce tequila. Um, so flying foxes hang out in large aggregations called camps. And whilst many of these camps can be found in forests and rural areas, they're also now common in urban areas too. And there's an incredible colony of flying foxes that you can see at Yarra Bend Park. So if you Google Parks Victoria, uh, grey-headed flying foxes, all of the details will come up online. And over summer, that population of grey-headed flying foxes can be as high as 30,000 individuals. The female flying foxes generally give birth to a single young each year from about September to November. So, you know, if you haven't been there before and you love that kind of thing, I definitely encourage you to go and have a look. So I mentioned before the Atlas of Living Australia, I had to do a little search um, on um, bat species in the Monash city area. And um, the most documented bat species is a micro bat called the Gould's wattle bat. So microbats, like their name suggests, differ significantly in size from megabats, like flying foxes. Um, and the Gould's microbat is around about 100 millimetres long, including its tail, and weighs about 15 grams. And here's a picture of a very handsome looking Gould's wattle bat. Um, so these bats roost in hollows in old trees, occasionally in ceilings, in basements of buildings also, um, and they roost together in colonies of around 30 bats. Now sadly, these micro bats are vulnerable to loss of roosting sites in tree hollows and also loss of feeding grounds um, due to forestry activities, um, urbanisation and clearing of land. Um, so there's lots of things that we can do to create bat-friendly habitat. Um, first and foremost, knowledge is really important. So researching your local bat species um, is, a, is a great way to start. And as I mentioned, the Atlas of Living Australia has a wealth of information on Australian bats. Um, also preserving and protecting existing natural habitats. Bats rely on a variety of roosting sites things like tree hollows and caves, which serve as safe havens for rest and raising their young. So conserving these essential habitats um, and presenting, preventing any unnecessary disturbances is really, really important. Um, another simple uh, but effective way to create bat a bat-friendly environment is providing water sources. So bats need nearby water um, for drinking and foraging on insects that are drawn to these um, water bodies. So things like small ponds, bird baths, or even rainwater catchment systems can offer bats hydration. Um, planting native trees, shrubs, and flowering plants in our landscapes not only enhances the biodiversity, but also provides bats with a diverse array of food sources. So many native plants are vital nectar and fruit resources for these incredible creatures. Um, also, artificial lighting can impact bats and other wildlife. Um, so although some lights attract insects, which is an important food source, particularly for small micro bats, bright lights in both cities and bushland areas might not be beneficial for bats and they can make them more vulnerable to predators. Now, I put a link um, to the Australian Bat Society, which is a peak body for bat conservation in the Australasian region. And it has a resources tab with so many different fact sheets containing lots of information to help you learn more about um, bats. So that's ozbats.org.au. I'd encourage you to go and have a look at that. So an essential aspect of wildlife conservation is the use of wildlife friendly netting practices. So if you do have fruit trees that you net, these are important things. So the first thing is to buy right. So when you're choosing um, netting for your crops and fruit trees, look for mesh with openings so small that you can't stick your pinky finger through. Um, another option that you could think about is um, if, you, if you have like a smaller orchard or couple of fruit trees, is covering the individual fruits with flower pots or fruit protection bags. And then it's also really important to think about how you're going to dispose of netting um, when it's at its end of life. So abandoned or improperly disposed netting can pose really serious threats for light wildlife and it can maim and inadvertently kill animals. So make sure that you discard your netting correctly. Now, this next slide here is hugely important and um, everybody knows the famous Australian song, Kookaburra Sits in the Old Gum Tree. 
Well, that song actually has a lot of truth in it. Old tree hollows are in high demand by pollinators and other wildlife um, because of their significance as essential nesting and sheltering sites. So approximately 17% of Australian birds use tree hollows to nest. Um, and it takes several decades and even centuries for trees to develop hollows suitable um, for nesting. So as urbanisation and land clearing continue, natural tree hollows are often removed, um, leaving native wildlife with fewer options for suitable nesting sites. And as the demand for tree hollows um, increases, there's a lot of intense competition amongst different species. And in many cases, it's the larger, more dominant species that displace the smaller ones from prime tree hollows. So with the decline in natural tree hollows, there are conservation efforts in place to install artificial nest boxes to mimic natural nesting sites. Um, now it's important to remember that while these can be beneficial, they don't fully replicate the conditions of natural tree hollows. So first and foremost is protecting and preserving existing hollows. It's really critical. Um, however, if you're interested in learning more, a really great place to visit is the La Trobe University Melbourne um, uh, Bandura campus. Um, and their native um, plant nursery has a huge selection of boxes. And the great thing is that they've actually had 30 years of experience refining their box designs. You can purchase the boxes flat packed um, or you can purchase them already made up, which is bit of the easier option. And I've brought a couple of examples along today for you guys to have a look at. Um, also, if you're a bit handy, there's a number of web websites that you can search to create your own nest boxes from scratch, which is also a really fun activity. Um, so with tree hollows being in prime real estate in urban areas, um, we can install bat roost boxes to provide supplementary habitat for urban micro bat species like the Gould's wattle bat that I mentioned earlier. Now, these are not for the megabat species like flying, flying foxes. They nest in camps in trees um, and other sheltered areas. But these bat, bat boxes really are artificial hollows designed to offer protection for bats during the daylight hours. I actually brought one along here for you to have a look at. <laughs> so the design of the bat roost box is um, really carefully crafted. Um, specifically for um, the needs of these species. So um, you can see that the bat box features a narrow slit entrance here at the bottom, which prevents any larger predators from gaining access, um, whilst also allowing the bats to easily um, exit and enter, you can see there. It also has a landing plate below the entrance, um, which um, you know allows them a comfortable place to enter and exit the box. And then inside, the internal cavity is quite spacious um, and it's enough to accommodate um, a typical group of, in, of um, bats ranging from up to 50 individuals. Um, then to ensure that they can nest um, securely inside, if you feel up, up, I'll hand this around later, you can see that it's got grooves inside where they can grab a stable foothold. Um, so I will pass that one around actually. Have a look if you like. There we go. Um, so by embracing supplementary habitat solutions like bat roost boxes, we can learn more about these species and create create a more awareness um, about the, our local ecosystems and the importance of these particular species. Okay, so moving on to our next pollinator, which is um, butterflies and moths. So these creatures belong to the Lepidoptera order of insects, which means scale wings in Greek. So the name comes from the tiny scales um, that cover their wings and give them their unique and intricate patterns. There's approximately 400 species of butterflies in Australia, with around 60 of those found around Melbourne. On the other hand, moths have approximately 20 to 30,000 species in Australia. So although butterflies and moths appear similar, they actually have some very distinguishing features. So butterflies um, possess club-shaped antennae um, and are active during the day, so they're diurnal. 
and they also fold their wings together at rest. Whereas moths lack the club-shaped um, antennae and are mostly active at night, so they're nocturnal, and they also keep their wings lying flat when they're resting. Butterflies and moths have taste receptors on their feet which allow them to assess the suitability of food sources and identify appropriate host plants for egg laying. Um, now, so if you see caterpillars feeding on your plants, it's really important to remember that they will eventually transform into butterflies, contributing to the pollination of our flowers. So you might want to consider planting to support caterpillars. And there's a variety of native plants that they love, including um, wattles, bush peas, and also purple flower, fan flowers. They love um, lamandra and also native grasses. Now, the journey from egg to butterfly is challenging um, with a survival rate of less than 1%. So it's a real number, numbers game for these creatures. They've got various predators that pose a threat at different stages of the butterfly's life cycle. So the eggs can be targeted by ants, parasitic wasps, the caterpillars um, can then be um, hosts, um, ho used as hosts for wasps. Um, and additionally, they've got birds preying on them as well. So it really highlights the fact that caterpillars are an essential part of your food, of the food web and the natural food, natural, um, food chain. So I just want to talk very briefly about the life cycle of a butterfly to show and show you this graphic because it's really important to think about what each stage of this life cycle needs in terms of food sources and habitat. So butterflies undergo a complete metamorphosis, which means that there's four separate stages in their life cycle. So we've got egg, larva, pupa and adult. So each stage looks completely different and serves a different purpose in the life of the insect. Um, so the first essential component of a butterfly-friendly garden is providing a bountiful food source for caterpillars. They're voracious eaters and they require solid food. So incorporating some caterpillar-friendly plants will really encourage them um, to survive that stage of their life cycle. Um, so for butterflies to lay their eggs, specific host plants are critical because different butterfly species have unique preferences when it comes to selecting um, the ideal plant for laying their eggs on. So as I mentioned before, they've got taste receptors on their feet which help them to select the best plants to lay their eggs. Now there's a really good list of host plants on page 17 of the Gardens for Wildlife booklet. Um, so I encourage you to have a look at that. Now adult butterflies need um, liquid food, so nectar producing plants are vital um, in any butterfly friendly garden. Um, another thing is a puddling station. Butterflies often gather around damp areas to sip minerals and nutrients that are found in moist soil. So by creating shallow puddle or damp patch, we can really um, offer a vital source of nourishment for butterflies. Then of course shelter is really important too. Um, so trees and shrubs offer that much needed shade for butterflies to rest and seek shelter in the hottest parts of the day. And in contrast, flat rocks are also a really good addition because butterflies need help warming up in the morning and those stones will provide a really nice basking spot for them so that they warm up, up enough to be able to take flight. Um, and then um, lastly, and this is really important, creating mass beds of colourful flowers is a great way to attract butterflies to your garden and it also makes your garden look really beautiful. Um, you may have seen online and in some hardware stores and gardening shops some supplementary habitat for butterflies. So whilst these look really cute, often these structures are pre-made overseas and they're fumigated when they arrive into Australia. Um, so the concept behind these hibernation houses is to provide a, shel a safe and sheltered um, environment for butterflies um, to seek refuge during the day um, and also during uh, you know, the colder winter months. Um, however, there's certain drawbacks associated with them. Um, if they're not properly maintained, they can really become breeding grounds for diseases and parasites. Um, and then that can obviously harm the butterflies that we 
put them there for. So um, the other product that you may have seen is nectar feeders. So if you've been to the Butterfly House at Melbourne Zoo, I don't know if anyone's been to the Butterfly House at Melbourne Zoo, you would have most certainly seen um, nectar feeders like the one pictured on the right here. Now these provide an instant source of energy for adult butterflies. Um, and then it ensures, you know, when there's no native plants around that they have something to feed on. Um, but, you know, they're, they're really good in an artificial environment like a butterfly house at the zoo. Um, however, there's quite a few downsides to nectar feeders. So one of the main concerns is their potential for increased predation. So the feeders might not just attract butterflies, but also um, the uh, creatures that feed on butterflies. And also, if they're not adequately maintained, they can get contaminated, which then would spread diseases. So when it comes to butterflies and moss, nothing beats creating natural habitat for them. Now, I'm going to move on to the incredible world of bees, one of my favourite um, things to talk about. So I've divided bees into three categories to make things simple. Native bees, which are both solitary and semi-social. Um, stingless native bees and European honeybees. And I do a whole workshop called Bee for Biodiversity on this topic. So we're just gonna cover some of the basics tonight. So let's start with native bees. Native bees are a diverse group that includes solitary and semi-social species. There's over 20,000 different species of native bee worldwide. And in Australia, we have a big diversity with over 2,000 species. Now the majority of um, native bees are solitary, meaning that they live individually rather than in colonies, and they make their homes in hollow stems or holes in the ground. Approximately 70% of native bees are ground nesters, and the remaining 30% prefer nesting in cavities. So habitat is hugely important for native bees. Moving on to stingless native bees, these bees are unique and share some similarities with honeybees. They also live in colonies, um, but as the name suggests, they lack the ability to sting. Um, they're primarily found in the northern and warm coastal parts of Australia and they play a critical role in pollination and contribute to the biodiversity of our natural ecosystems and they also make a delicious and highly valued honey. Um, and then lastly, European honeybees. So European honeybees are managed by beekeepers like myself who are called apiarists um, and bees have co-evolved with our food production systems over thousands of years. So in addition to honey production, honey produ bees um, also provide the essential service of pollination. Um, the beauty of them is that they can be transported to mass pollination events like when the almonds flower or when the peaches come into bloom. Um, and they then provide an instant population of pollinators in these um, agricultural systems that are otherwise a monoculture that might not be um, attractive to other pollinators. So in Australia alone, honeybees are responsible for pollinating more than 53 major food crops. Um, and, um, you know, their pollination services provide us with fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, which really underpin our healthy diet. Um, so they're really, really important for our food security, but also for maintaining ecosystem health. Um, so both sol social and solitary bees have important roles as pollinators, but their nesting behaviours and social structures are quite different. Um, so I wanted to point out a few of these differences because it's really important to understand when we're looking at how we can create habitat for different species of bees. So let's start with social bees. Um, like European honeybees and native stingless bees. So these bees live in colonies that are very expansive, com comprising of um, a queen, male drones and female worker bees. So within the colonies, roles are divided distinctly. So the queen's responsible for reproduction and maintaining the colony's population, while the worker bees perform a myriad of tasks like foraging, um, maintain maintaining the hive and nurturing the young. And the drone bees um, play a role in reproduction and um, hive temperature regulation, and they're also said to contribute to the overall morale of the hive too. Um, so although honeybees are physically independent, they can't survive for extended periods of time as an individual. So they're known as a super organism. Um, social bee colonies construct in intricate 
nests and those are often made out of wax or other vegetation where the entire colony or community resides and collaborates. So communication is a real hallmark of social bees. Um, they use sophisticated systems involving pheromones, you might have heard of the waggle dance, so dancing, and other behaviours to um, coordinate the activities within the colony. So they're quite fascinating. Um, and also colonies can survive for several years um, with overwintering bees starting new colonies in the subsequent um, seasons. And it's this reason why, um, well, one of the reasons why bees um, make and store honey it's to ensure the survival of the colony, so if, um, when the floral resources are scarce. So unlike um, social, their social counterparts, solitary and semi-social bees live more independent lives. So each female constructs and provisions her individual nests. So um, solitary bees create nests in diverse locations, including tunnels um, in the ground, hollow plant stems, um, and in existing cavities like beetle holes in trees. The division of labour is limited amongst um, solitary bees. Each female basically um, collects pollen, gathers nectar, lays eggs and provisions individual nest cells for her offspring. Um, unlike social bees, solitary bees have shorter lifespans um, and typically um, they'll live for a single season. So their life cycle from emergence to mating and completion can occur within um, a few weeks or months. Um, also, communication is much simpler amongst solitary semi-social bees. They use real simple visual clues and scent markings to find and recognise their nests. Um, semi-social bees exhibit a blend of social and solitary traits. So they may have small groups of related females sharing a nest um, and engaging in cooperative behaviours, but with much less complexity than fully social bees. And lastly, a question that I get asked a lot, um, solitary and semi-social bees don't make or store honey. Um, so it's something that people often ask. So I've spoken um, about pollen and nectar earlier from a plant perspective. Now I want to talk about these important substances from a bee's perspective because it'll really help you to understand how to attract bees to your garden. So firstly, to attract bees to your garden, you need to provide them with a food source. And bees require nectar, which is their carbohydrate, and pollen, which is their protein source. And they collect these from flowers. So therefore it's, you know, goes without saying, it's important to plant a diverse range of flowers in your garden that provide bees with a continuous supply of food over the seasons. So back at the hive, bees regurgitate nectar that they've collected into the mouth of other bees um, through a process called trophallaxis. Um, and this regurgitation and sharing of nectar among the bees helps to start the process of converting it into honey. So honey serves as a critical food source for the honeybees during the times when, you know, the, their flowers are scarce, like we spoke about before. Um, so I'm going to move on to this slide here. So as I mentioned before, there's over 2,000 species of native bee in Australia and each have their own um, unique features. And in this picture, you'll see three species that are native to Victoria. Um, so when spring hits, I would definitely encourage you to look out for them. And I've actually brought another really cool poster here that you can have a look at later. And this also shows a variety of other species of native bees. They're quite fascinating. I love native bees. Um, so starting with um, the left, we've got the leaf cutter bee. So these bees are reasonably sized with an average length of 7 to 17 millimetres. And there's about 40 different species of leaf cutter bees. Um, so that whilst it can be challenging to spot, it's a unique nesting behaviour that often leaves behind evidence of their presence. The leaf cutter bee has a habit of cutting circular pieces in the leaves um, that they're collecting to line their um, nests. So they often retrofit pre-existing holes left by wood borers to create clean hygienic nests um, that they then make their own. Um, so next time you notice a plant with a perfectly circular hole, it could be the work of a leaf cutter bee. Um, so the next bee along, um, its name really doesn't need much explanation. Um, these bees are super fluffy, which is how they got their name teddy bear bees. 
Um, and they're amongst the largest bees found in Australia with an approximate size of 15 to 20 millimetres. Um, so um, each has its own unique behaviours, each of the different 25 different species have their own unique behaviours. Um, but these bees are known to be buzz pollinators. So a buzz um, pollinator basically lands on a flower, they grab um, onto the anthers, remember the pollen producing areas of the flower with their legs and mandible, mandibles, and then they contract their flight muscles um, and they rapidly vibrate. And this, this vibration causes the anthers to release pollen grains, which stick to the bee's body, and then with plenty of pollen all over their fluffy body, they're then ready to cross-pollinate flowers. So it's an incredible process. Now the last bee featured here is one of my favourites, the blue banded bee. And I like to call these guys the supermodels of the bee world um, because they've got strikingly beautiful blue stripes on their abdomen and stunning green eyes. Not all features have the blue like that, but some species do. So um, like the teddy bear bee, they also are buzz pollinators. They're slightly smaller than honeybees, so they're around um, 10 to 12 millimetres in length. I get these guys in my garden and it's really easy to recognise them because they're quite loud when they're pollinating um, and they're just gorgeous. And so they are um, prevalent in, um, in Melbourne, so take a look out for those. Um, I mentioned before about stingless um, bees. So there's been a big interest in native bees in recent times. There's 11 different species of Australian stingless bees and they're collectively known as sugar bag bees. So they're quite small, measuring only three to five millimetres. And you can see, if you look at the bottom right hand picture, um, there's a native bee next to a European um, honeybee on a camellia flower. Um, these bees are found in the warmer climates of northern New South Wales and Queensland. So unfortunately they're not found in Victoria, but in other parts of Australia they're kept in managed colonies, just like European honeybees. And they're being used um, by farm some farmers to pollinate their crops too, so um, that's one to look out for. And I've got a, a good book actually. Um, if you're interested, this is a really great book and I'll show you later if you want to take a photograph of it. Um, so. Um, so one of the most effective ways to create bee-friendly habitats is by de de designing a diverse landscape um, and including um, a variety of native plant species. Native plants have co-evolved alongside local bee populations, providing them with ideal food sources and ensuring their survival. So the other thing that you should consider doing is leaving some patches of bare soil in your garden because these patches will serve as nesting sites for many solitary bee species. So as we've learned, solitary bees don't live in colonies like honeybees, um, but they're equally as important pollinators. Um, another critical aspect of bee-friendly habitat is to provide damp areas or shallow water sources. Bees, like all living creatures, need water su to survive. Um, so make sure your water source is shallow and has some areas for bees to perch whilst they're drinking so that they don't drown. That's really, really important. And then shelter from extreme weather conditions and predators and other disturbances is really important. So including shrubs, trees and dense vegetation will really give um, bees a safe place to take refuge. And lastly, and very importantly, is ensuring floral resources year round because bees need that food supply throughout the seasons. So by selecting a diverse range of um, flowering plants that bloom at different times of the year, bees are then gonna have that access to pollen and nectar. And at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna show you an excellent resource that you can download on the internet that'll help you to choose what you plant to have those year round blooms. Now, Talking about supplementary habitat, um, there are four um, different types of bee hotels. So firstly, um, we've got hollow pithy tubes for stem nesters. Um, brought one along here. This is a really super um, simple one. Um, so these are made by um, cutting um, 15 to 20 centimetre lengths of hollow stems. I've used hydrangea stems here, but you can also use things like raspberry canes and bamboo. And then you just arrange them in a cluster and because they've got cellulose, the bees chew through the cellulose to create their little nests. So they, this is a really simple one. Um, 
Secondly, um, we've got drilled wood blocks that mimic um, borer holes in trees and they're perfect for hole nesters. And then thirdly, mud brick, which is ideal for ground nesting bees like blue banded bees. So homemade mud bricks or compacted um, clay or earth and loam can be packed into a container like a terracotta pot or lengths of PVC downpipe if you have any of those spare. And then lastly, <coughs> we've got the um, combination of bamboo stems, drilled wood and mud bricks can be used. So when you're deciding on the location of your bee hotel, it's really important to consider that morning sun's good, but afternoon sun's not. Now, I've brought along um, a really simple bee hotel um, that you can make at home with a few tools. So I'm just gonna run through this process. So this is um, a drilled wood bee hotel that can attract a variety of bees, including the leaf cutter bee, um, mass bee and resin bee. And I've made this one out of completely recycled materials. So this is an old pat, something from an old pallet and a little roof here. Um, so what you'll need to make one of these is a tape measure, a drill bit um, and a drill, a marking pen, a gas torch um, and sandpaper and some hard or soft wood. You need to make sure that the wood um, is not being treated. That's really, really important. So all you really do is you measure out your um, wood block to approximately 20 centimetres in length. Use a bit of elbow grease to chop um, and uh, using a saw. I'm going to hand this one round actually whilst I'm talking so people can have a bit of a look. There we go. Um, so then you mark out where you're going to drill. Um, and there's a number of different um, cavity diameters and depths that you can use. For this bee hotel, I use six millimetre hole, 150 deep, which is one of the most commonly used. But you can also use five mil, 120 deep, or eight mil, 150 deep. Um, it's really important um, to avoid providing nest holes that are too shallow, um, because um, above ground cavity nesting bees usually fill the cells with female offspring first and then male cells later. So if the nest holes are too short, this can cause an um, imbalance in gender. So make sure that you have a drill bit that's long enough. Um, so when you drill the holes, try to make them a slight upward um, angle because this is appealing to the bees and it also avoid water pooling after um, a rain event. Um, and make sure that your holes are at least 20 millimetres between the centres of neighbouring holes. And once you finish drilling the holes, sand over the entrances to make sure that there's no splinters that might damage the wings of bees entering. And then lastly, to make it most attractive to bees, um, you can slightly char the wood using a gas torch or just a gas burner. Um, and this will help to remove any little splinters that you can't see as well. Um, so again, super, super simple to make these things. The simpler, the better really, I think. Um, and maybe you'll have a try at making one of those at home. Um, and over time, one thing that's really important to remember too is that bee hotels can accumulate debris, mites and pathogens that can really negatively impact the health of bees. So it's really critical to maintain um, nest hygiene to ensure the long-term success of your bee hotel. And what you can do is you can use um, paper straws like this to um, line the holes and then replace them once the nesting activities is over. Um, and the other thing that you can do is um, uh, when, as I mentioned before, is um, in between seasons, you could use pipe cleaner and water, but make sure that you only do this um, once the bees have emerged. So like winter would be a good time to do that. But you know, these bee hotels don't last forever. So it's important to remember that they need to be replaced um, over time. Okay, so that's bees for you. We're gonna move on to wasps. So while they're not primary pollinators like bees, some wasps can inadvertently transfer pollen between flowers, whilst others like fig wasps, spider wasps, um, flower wasps and potter wasps can play a more significant role in pollination. But one of the services that they do provide is biological control, preying on crop pests. Parasitic wasps in particular have a fascinating life cycle where the female lays eggs on um, a nearby host and the developing larvae eventually cause the host demise. 
Um, now, if you Google wasps friendly habitat, the majority of results will be telling you how to get rid of wasps, <laughs> um, not how to encourage them to your garden. But wasps are the good guys and there's a huge biodiversity of wasps in Australia. Um, people often get native and European wasps confused. So if you're confused, make sure that you consult some experts before trying to remove wasps from an ecosystem because they're a really important part of it. Um, so this, these two pictures here are actually of two mud double wasp nests. One's from um, my Melbourne unit and the other one is from my farm. And I get lots of spiders in both places. And mud double wasps love to prey on spiders. So their presence is a really good evidence of a healthy food web and nature keeping in balance. Um, so a very, it's really common um, for Australian native solitary wasps to share a bee hotel. And like native bees, solitary wasps um, uh, can sting, um, but they're generally not aggressive because they don't have a queen that they're trying to, uh, or a large nest that they're trying to defend. Um, so wasps and bees have a major difference in their diet. Wasps catch insect prey to feed their young, whereas bees collect um, pollen and nectar. So when plants started to produce pollen and nectar, the bees' wasp ancestors evolved to become vegetarian and use these new resources. So bees actually evolved um, from wasps millions of years ago. So if you notice wasps nesting in your bee hotel, it's a really fascinating reminder of their shared ancestry. Um, and you might even notice them bringing captured insects back to their nest. Um, this picture here is of um, some European wasps and they were first found in Australia in 1959 after being introduced from overseas. European wasps have several distinguishing features including black and yellow body, um, yellow legs, triangular markings on the abdomen and black antennae. Um, they're a social species and they build their nests out of um, chewed up fibrous wood. So they invented paper way before humans did. Um, but if you have a European wasp nest at your home, um, you can contact a pest controller. Um, or if they're a nuisance pest in a public space, you can contact the local council, your local council. Um, so if left alone, um, European wasps are not aggressive to humans or other animals. But if they're aggrava um, aggravated, they can sting. And as I mentioned, unlike um, bees, the European wasp can sting multiple times. Um, but this is one of the stunning native wasps that we have in Australia. It's the blue flower wasp. These wasps are solitary insects and they're not aggressive towards humans. Um, they're primarily known for their really interesting reproductive behaviour. So the female blue flower wasp is what's called a um, parasitoid. And um, she lays eggs on the larvae of scarab beetles. So um, the female locates a scarab beetle within the soil. She paralyzes it with her venomous stinger and then lays a single egg on the immobilized larva. So the wasp larva then hatches and feeds on the paralyzed beetle, eventually causing its demise. So um, quite fascinating story there. Um, so we're going to move on now to birds. So in Australia, there's over 100 species of birds that visit flowers. And the most abundant group is honey eaters, which there's about 75 species. So these birds have specialised beaks and tongues for collecting nectar, and they inadvertently transfer pollen as they feed on flowers um, of various plant species. Now there's some great information on pages 18 to 21 of the Gardens for Wildlife booklet on how to attract various birds to your garden. I'm going to give you some really general guidelines here um, and then you can consult the booklet for some specific plants that will um, attract parrots and honey eaters to your backyard. So all birds need food, water, shelter and a place to nest. So creating a habitat with a high degree of structural complexity at the ground, shrub and canopy level is the most effective way to imitate the, the undisturbed um, habitats that birds flourish in. Um, so we should kind of be moving away from that traditional idea of a garden being tall trees and open lawn. Um, Standing dead and fallen trees provide valuable habitat um, and often um, 
because they often have like these tree hollows um, that have developed over a long period of time. So if you're removing dead trees, you might be removing bird habitat. Um, it's an absolute joy to see um, native birds drinking nectar from native plants. So planting nectar rich natives is a great way to attract them to your garden. Um, and also make sure that you provide a water source for um, drinking and preening. So for those of you who might not be familiar with the word preening, um, it's a grooming behaviour commonly observed in birds. So birds have specialised feathers that help them to fly, to keep warm and stay dry. And over time, these feathers can become dirty, oily or damaged due to various environmental factors. So preening helps to keep their feathers in good condition and also serves as a social behaviour in some species. So next time that you see a bird grooming itself, you'll know that it's engaging in this really essential preening process. Um, so there's some suggestions for bird baths. So um, if you have a bird bath, place it in a dappled um, shaded area um, to prevent it from becoming too hot. As you know, we're getting some really hot days during summer, so you don't want to have boiling hot water in your bird bath. Um, also ensure that the water is replaced regularly and that the bath scrubbed out to maintain cleanliness from time to time. Um, another thing is to provide dense shrubs nearby your bird bath because this will allow birds that might feel threatened to have somewhere to escape to. Um, your bird bath should be shallow, so less than five centimetres, with um, a rough base which will then minimise the risk of drown birds drowning. Um, and then. Try and position your bird bath in a relatively open space with a perching spot because this allows birds to be able to observe the bath to see if there's any approaching threats before they use it. Um, and if you're using a pedestal bath, make sure that it's stable and placed high off the ground. Um, now, in terms of supplementary habitat for pollinating birds, the first thing that I will mention is that you should avoid feeding birds. Um, they don't need supplementary habitat and putting out seed trays and other scraps will usually attract more aggressive birds. So it won't be serving the purpose that you're putting them there for anyway. Um, however, with tree hollows in short supply, nest boxes can offer a really unique opportunity for us to get up close with nature and connect with birds that we do visit our backyards. So when you're installing a nest box, it's really important to consider the positioning. So facing the nest box away from prevailing winds and ensuring that it's waterproof um, will really make sure that you're giving that comfortable um, environment for the birds to their nest. Um, the other thing that's really important is the design of the nest box. So it should suit the specific needs of the bird species that you're trying to attract. So different birds have varying preferences in terms of the box shape and dimensions. And as I spoke about the ones that you can um, buy, there's a whole ton of different um, dimensions that you can use. And this will really um, make sure that you're um, increasing the chances of birds successfully breeding. Um, if possible, you should try and keep records of which species are visiting your nesting boxes. And you can even use that information and enter it into a citizen science project. So if you have a look at the BirdLife Australia website, there's lots of details about this. Um, and then finally, for ease of monitoring and maintenance, um, it's good to um, have bird boxes that have a hinged lid. Now, being a beekeeper, I quite often get calls from um, people during the spring and summertime that um, a swarm of bees has nested in their bird box. And this is one of the things with, you know, there's a booming interest in backyard beekeeping. If you have the hinge on your nest box and a bee colony does take residence in there, it makes it a lot easier for the beekeeper to then rescue those bees rather than if it's um, shut, it'll be a lot more disturbance to that bee colony. Um, but if you do notice just a couple of bees around that next nest box, they're probably going to take residence pretty soon. And if you don't want them there, it's best to call a bee tech keeper to take care of it. Okay, we've got two more pollinating species to cover. Um, this is, flies are actually one of my favourite and I know that they're often regarded as nuisance pests but they're actually a really important group of insects from a pollination perspective. They're actually the second most 
um, important pollinator to bees. So many fly species visit flowers regularly and they also contribute to other ecological processes such as decomposition and biological pest control and they're also a really essential part of the food web. So recognising the diversity of fly species and conserving them is really important to healthy ecosystems. One particularly fascinating spot fly species is the hoverfly. These are one of my favourites. Um, and you can see one in the picture here. They quite often get mistaken for bees, but if you watch their hovering flight pattern, it really explains their names. Now, one way to distinguish flies from bees is that they have eyes on top of their head rather than on the side. Um, and they also only have two wings as opposed to bees having four. And you can see here as well, they've got little short antennae rather than the long antennae that bees have. Now to create a fly friendly habitat, all you really need to do is plant a variety of flowering plants. Um, flies are attracted to plants with, with strong smelling flowers. So some really good examples are marigolds, which are also a good companion plant. Um, straw flowers, I love those, and sunflowers. Um, and also include plants with different bloom times to ensure that flies have a continuous um, food source throughout the seasons. Native plants are particularly well suited for local fly species or native fly species because um, they're a natural part of the ecosystem. Um, and they also attract a wider range of beneficial insects that flies feed on. Um, now flies are attracted to animal waste so it's really important to make sure that you're cleaning up pet waste or chicken poo in your backyard because this will avoid you having you know excessive um, populations of flies so just something to remember. Um, and moving on to our last um, pollinating species, a remarkable group of creatures that often go unnoticed in the world of pollination are beetles and they're specifically um, members of the order Coleoptera. So these beetles play a critical role in pollination. Unlike their buzzing counterparts, um, they have a unique approach to pollination. So they crawl upon native flowers, delicately collecting pollen and indulging in nectar. And as they um, move from flower to flower, they unwittingly transfer pollen grains, aiding in the process of fertilisation. So the life cycle of beetles includes an essential phase which their larvae thrive. So these young beetles feed on decaying wood and organic matter. And this really contributes to the ecosystem's vital processes of decomposition and nutrient cycling. Um, so this makes feeding them really, really easy. All you need to do is provide them with leaf litter and rotting wood. Um, beetles have relatively smooth body surfaces, making it challenging for pollen to adhere to their bodies. However, um, this example here is the flower chafer beetle. Um, and it has tiny hairs on its abdomen, which you can see. And these hairs create a sticky surface that can attract and hold pollen grains, aiding their transportation from one flower to another. Um, so there's a few simple changes that we can make to encourage beetles to our backyards. And one thing that's a bit of a change of mindset for some people is to avoid excessive pruning because this can disrupt the natural habitat that beetles rely on. So leaving some fallen leaf litter, natural debris and dead wood can really help local bee popula uh, um, beetle populations. Um, providing shelter and hiding places is equally important. So beetles seek refuge in various spots such as mulch, leaf litter, rocks, logs and fallen branches. So by incorporating these elements into your garden, you're really offering safe havens for beetles to thrive. And then lastly, education is a really powerful tool and learning about the different species of beetle in your area is a great first step. Um, as I mentioned, it's one of the biggest group of, um, of uh, insects. So um, they've got unique, you know, habitats and preferences and behaviours. So learn as much as you can. Um, I have brought along a really great book. This is a really good um, book that's recently been released that um, tells some great stories about native bee species, beetle species. Um, so... We're now at the end of our most important pollinating species. Now, this is not an exhaustive list by any means of the imagination, but it is an introduction to some of the most prolific pollinators. So before we move on to the next bit of our presentation, I'm wondering if anybody's got any questions. Just thinking 
um, sorry, we got um, the B Hotel, yes. which has never been cleaned, so it's kind of a spider hotel now. Yes. Is that okay? <laughs> it's probably best to start again, I would say, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I call mine the Hotel California because it's got lots of spiders, so if you enter, you're probably never going to exit, so yeah. Okay, so we'll move on to the last part of our presentation, which focuses on the things that we can do to help pollinators and help the planet. This is really a bit of a reiteration of some of the things we've already learned. But every year in November, one of the most important events on the calendar for pollinators is Australian Pollinator Week. And during this week, you can become a citizen science and contribute to scientific research on how our pollinators are faring, which is really important. Um, so for more information, you just need to Google Australian Pollinator Week and there's a series of activities and workshops that you can join. Um, it's a really well-designed citizen science project because you get a bit of training about how to identify pollinating species before you start making um, and submitting observations. So I'd definitely encourage you to look up that one. Um, now, what can we do to help our pollinators? I've put threats on um, the left and actions on the right. So as human populations expand and urbanisation spreads, pollinators lose their natural habitats. Um, and this loss affects their ability to find suitable nesting sites and compromises their overall population health. So habitat loss specifically impacts their foraging um, areas, depriving them of essential pollen and nectar sources that they rely on for their survival. Another significant threat is habitat fragmentation. So the fragmentation of natural areas into small, more isolated pockets really disrupts pollinators' ability to move between habitats and find diverse food sources and nesting sites. And this fragmentation can also lead to population decline and genetic isolation. The use of chemicals like pesticides, um, and herbicides poses a significant risk to pollinators. So these chemicals can be toxic for them, affecting their behaviour, their reproduction and their overall health. And lastly, lack of education and advocacy also contributes to the challenges pollinators face. Many people are unaware of the critical role that pollinators play in our ecosystems and also in our food security. Now, let's delve into some of the actions we can take to help and safeguard the future of pollinators. So firstly, conserving their natural habitat is paramount. Whether it's protecting existing natural areas or creating new habitats, we need to maintain and restore pollinators' home. home. So by doing things like preserving wildflowers, planting native vegetation, avoiding habitat destruction, we really contribute to the well-being of pollinators. Planting for a continuous supply of pollen and nectar-rich um, flowers is really critical. So by selecting flowering plants that bloom throughout the season, we're giving pollinators a consistent and diverse food source. Um, and then establishing corridors that connect habitats for pollinators to move freely and access different areas. And these corridors can take the form of green spaces, hedge roads, or even plantings along roadsides. By creating these interconnected habitats, we enable pollinators to find suitable nesting sites, to be able to forage for food and to maintain genetic diversity. And um, there is a wonderful project called the Melbourne Pollinator Corridor, which is an eight kilometre community driven wildlife corridor that stretches from the Royal Botanic Gardens to Westgate Park and it's called the Heart Gardening Project. It's really worth Googling and having a look at. Um, you'll be able to learn some more. I love it because it's a community-driven pro project and it's a really big stretch of um, habitat in an urban area. And then, of course, reducing and ceasing our use of pesticides and opting for natural um, alternatives wherever possible. So by embracing, inter embracing um, integrated pest management practices, we really create safer environments for pollinators. And there's some excellent um, information on pages 27 and 34 of the Gardens for Harvest booklet on this topic. So um, to look at how you can reduce or even cease your use of um, chemicals in your garden, have a look at that. Um, and last but not least, education is a powerful tool. By showing interest and learning as much as we can about pollinators, we really become empowered to make informed choices and take appropriate actions. 
Um, and this also allows us to spread awareness throughout our communities and encourage others to join as well. So thank you for being here tonight. It's really important. Um, so um, whether you're an experienced gardener or just starting out, uh, creating a pollinator friendly garden can be really rewarding. So by implementing a few key strategies, you can really transform your garden into a vibrant haven to support pollinators. So the first step in attracting pollinators is to create complexity and diversity in your garden. So in, as I mentioned before, instead of the uniform landscape of tall trees, open lawn, it's great to embrace different plants, different textures and different heights. So by incorporating a variety of plant species, you're really going to be providing a diverse range of resources and habitats for pollinators. So think about incorporating trees, shrubs, perennials and annuals and creating a multi-layered garden. Um, another really important thing is providing specific nesting places for pollinators. So some species require specific plants and soil types in order to reproduce. So by understanding these requirements and creating those habitats, you can really encourage pollinators um, not just to find habitat, but also to thrive in your garden. Um, flowers are nature's most alluring invitation to pollinators. So to attract a wide range of pollinators, make sure that you're planting dense clumps of flowers. So grouping plants together not only increases their visual impact, but also um, provides a concentrated nectar and pollen source for pollinators. Um, also aim for a balanced mix of native and non-native flowering plants so that you've got that con continuous supply of blooms throughout the season. And then, um, of course, I've mentioned this a number of times, um, what, providing a water source is really, really important. And then lastly, if you've got the space, think about incorporating some supplementary habitat like um, a bee hotel or a bat box or a bird box um, that we've um, spoken about tonight as well. Um, so just in summary, the four most important things to remember about creating habitat is layers, food, water and shelter. Um, now remember that um, before you begin, take some time to observe the natural environment, taking into account things like rainfall, sunny and shady places, windy and sheltered areas. Document the existing wildlife that's in your garden and look at ways that you can embrace the biodiversity um, that is already in your backyard. So you don't have to um, reinvent the wheel, you don't have to rip things out and start from scratch. On the contrary, you should be looking at how you can enhance what you already have. And then use some of the free tools that I've mentioned, like the Atlas of Living Australia, iNaturalist, and these wonderful guides here. Um, another consideration is to know your soil. Think about what you're planting. Monash soils are a mix of sands, clays and loams. Um, indigenous plants are suited to the original soils of the area. However, your um, soil in your garden might be depleted or it might have actually been imported from another part of Melbourne, which quite often happens with new urban developments. Um, so there's lots of things that you can do to improve the quality of your soil, but to ensure the survival of your plants, it's important to make sure that they're adapted to the soil conditions that you're going to plant them in at your site. Um, now lastly, um, I just wanted to sort of end off with some of my favourite plants for pollinators, and this is by far not an exhaustive list. Um, however, you'll find that you can pick up most of these um, as tube stock from your local native plant nursery, or um, if you love gardening, you can um, try propagating seeds or cuttings, um, which is really a rewarding. But I've got here um, tea tree, we've got calistamon, there's lots of different varieties of um, grevillea, dianella is another great one. We're really lucky to have such beautiful native plants in Australia and one of my favourite times of year is when the acacias bloom on my farm. Um, they're so, I love their beautiful vibrant yellow colour and I also love watching the bees coming back to the beehive with their little pollen booties um, <laughs> on their legs. Um, so uh, here we've got acacias. Um, the other one is Banksia, that's um, absolutely beautiful. I think I've got some Banksia honey over there as well, if anybody wants to come and taste it later. Um, and then um, there's so many different varieties of flowering eucalyptus. Um, and then I love the um, uh, pincushion um, hikea tree as well, it's another beautiful one. 
Um, and here's some of the beautiful native flowers. I love all of these, but I especially love straw flowers because they smell irresistible and hoverflies love them. Um, the other one that's really great is a coria um, because it has a really long flowering period. Um, we've also got um, running postman, heath. Bees love purple coloured flowers, so the um, purple coral pea is great. And then another one that you'll see in a lot of native reserve, reserves is the hop um, gordinia. That's another really beautiful one. Um, in terms of exotics, here are some that bees go wild for, and I particularly love um, salvia because the um, blue banded bees love them in my garden. Um, another one um, which is really great is the budlia, which is also known as butterfly bush. Um, and it's flowering at the moment, it smells magnificent. Um, so there's many wonderful um, free resources to help guide us from here. Um, and, um, you know, you, Monash, has put together, Monash Council's put together these two wonderful booklets. Um, there's also a really great resource, um, the, which is um, from an organisation called When Bee Foundation. It's called the Powerful Pollinators Guide. And you can go, download this from their website for free. Um, and there's a guide that's specific to South East Melbourne. Um, and the good thing about this is that um, it tells you the months of the year, um, what to plan, and also which pollinating um, insects and creatures that it's attra that are attracted to those plants. Um, if you're a bookworm like me, there are so many books that you can read um, about how to attract pollinators to your garden, but I've put a couple on this slide and I've brought them along as well if you want to have a flick through after the presentation. But before we finish, I just want to share this thought with you. Um, the benefits of conserving biodiversity and the collect cumulative effect for, of ecosystem services outweighs the cost to repair or replace those services. Conservation is less expensive than restoration. And that quote comes from Australia's strategy for nature. So now is the time to act for nature. And in finishing up, I just wanted to go back to those three calls of action for tonight. Plant for the pollinators, avoid harmful chemi chemicals, and learn and advocate. So that's all from me tonight. Um, Thanks for coming along. I, I'd love to open the forum to any questions that anybody has. So um, if you have questions, you can either ask them now or come up to me after the presentation and ask. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much to Helen. I think we can all agree that we've only really scratched the surface of Helen's extensive knowledge on pollinators. So a really, really big thank you um, for your, it was so valuable to hear from you and to learn that beetles and um, flies and some of those pollinators that we wouldn't even think about um, are so valuable to our ecosystems and for encouraging pollination. Um, so just a quick uh, final note, for those tuning in online, if you did have any questions that you've been submitting, we do have a record of those and we'll be sending out a follow-up email to all people that are booked uh, just with the recorded live stream link um, and an answer with all those questions and additional information for Monash programs. Um, for those in person, feel free to stick around. As Helen mentioned, she's brought along some, I'm sure, delicious honey and um, some different displays and things that you can have a look at of uh, insect hotels and native habitat that we can be introducing into our own gardens. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, we do have a range of Monash programs that you may have heard of or you may have not. Um, we have the Monash Gardens for Wildlife program. As Helen mentioned, um, this booklet here, we've got these available for anyone that's attended in person today, but it's also available online to order uh, just for free. Um, and that's a great resource for getting started with Indigenous gardening. And we offer free seedlings. So you get 20 seedlings just for doing a survey online, but then an additional 20 seedlings uh, for having a garden guide, which is a really experienced volunteer uh, that helps out with that program. Come visit your garden and give advice. Uh, we also have our nature strip planting program. So lots of fantastic ways that you can